All right, ninth grade students, soon to be 10th graders, I'm hoping for all of you, because uh, you're working hard, I hope, really do. And uh, we're reading. And um, we are on page 52 of Into the Clouds. Page 52, lots of interesting photos in this one. And uh, you might take a look at the pictures of these uh, men who are kind of our next adventure group. Uh, 1939, The Hermit of K2, Boys to Men, Chapter 5. Eight months after he sat near the top of the world, pondering his place in the universe, Charlie Houston found himself at, himself at a dinner table on the wealthy Upper East Side of Manhattan. Sitting near him was 26-year-old college student named Jack Durance. The dinner was a final celebration for Durance before he boarded a ship, crossed the Atlantic, and met up with Fritz Weissner. Durance was leaving to climb K2 with the second American Karakoram expedition. He would be following Houston's route up the mountain. Houston was working in a New York hospital now, and the work left him little time to do anything else but K2 was still on his mind. He was worried about the expedition Durance was about to join and he couldn't resist letting the dinner guests know. Besides Weisner, none of the climbers had much experience. Durance had climbed some of the hardest rock walls in the Western United States, but only Weisner had been to the Himalayas before. Durance took the opportunity to ask Houston for some advice. He was just an undergraduate preparing for medical school, but there was no real doctor on the expedition. If anyone went down with altitude sickness or a broken limb, Durance would have to treat them. Houston gave the most practical advice he could. Watch out for frostbite. If anyone started showing signs, keep his toes or fingers clean and dry, get him down the mountain quickly. As dinner wore on, Houston tired of the talk about K2. Less than a year ago, he had stood just 2,000 feet below the summit. He was convinced he had been right to turn back. His body had reached its limit. Without matches, it would have been foolish to stay at the high camp and try again the next day. And publicly, Houston always said that the journey itself was more important than the goal. But still, it was hard not to have doubts. The weather had been good. What if they had regrouped, resupplied the high camps and tried again? Years later, Petzoltz insisted they should have done exactly that. We made up our mind not to climb the mountain, he said. If we'd have brought up a little bit more food and planned to get to the summit, we could have come back as conquerors of K2. Could they have made it? Houston didn't know. But with memories of K2 haunting him, he knew he didn't want to be at the dinner anymore. At 9.30, he got up, said his goodbyes, and left abruptly. He spent the next couple of hours wandering the streets of New York, lost in thought. While Houston tried to come to terms with his memories of K2, Fritz Weissner prepared his assault on the mountain. He was in Europe, stocking up on equipment and waiting for his team to assemble. Thanks to Houston, Weissner knew a lot more about the task ahead than he would have a year ago. Houston had drawn up a two-page single-space description of his route up the Abruzzi Ridge. He described rock formations and ice climbs. He made corrections to the Duke's map of the mountain from 1909. On the mountain itself, the team had left ropes and pythons in place to mark routes for Weissner. For all the tension that had built up between them, Houston and Weissner had a lot in common. They had skied and climbed together. They were devoted to the mountains. And Weissner shared Houston's desire to keep climbing simple. To him, it was a test of skill and daring. 
a true mountaineer climbed with as little mechanical protection as possible and left the mountain in the same condition as he found it. But as leaders, Houston and Weissler couldn't have been more different. To Houston, every expedition was a democracy. When important decisions came up, he gathered his partners in a tent and took a vote. The Fellowship of the Rope came first, the summit second. Weissner, on the other hand, had a reputation as a stubborn, stubborn single-minded leader. Once he chose a path, he stayed on it. He had little tolerance for people who couldn't or wouldn't keep up. Unfortunately, among the climbers making their way to Europe to join the expedition, it was hard to pick out one who stood a chance of keeping up. That certainly wasn't the way Weissner had planned it. He had tried to recruit the best mountaineers in the U.S., starting with Houston's team. He asked Bates, Birdsall, and House to join him. They all turned him down. House, for one, had climbed with Weiss number four. He knew how demanding his friend could be, and he had no desire to be stuck in the Himalaya with him for four months. One by one, Weissner's other top choices ruled themselves out. One couldn't afford the trip. Another dropped out when his wife had a miscarriage. A third broke his leg skiing just before the expedition left. Weissner was left with a makeshift team. He had three students from Dartmouth College, Durance, George Sheldon, and Chap Cranmer. At 26, Durance was by far the most experienced of the three. Sheldon had never been on a long expedition. Cranmer had climbed in Canada with Weisner and in the Alps with his parents. But he hadn't ventured above 15,000 feet. He wasn't even old enough to vote. The other two team members seemed to have been chosen more for their wealth than their climbing talents. Tony Cromwell was 47. He spent his days traveling in Europe, climbing the Alps with a guide. He told Weissner before they left that he wouldn't climb above Camp 4. The last team member was a sportsman named Dudley Wolf. Wolf was heir to a fortune dug out of the silver mines of Colorado in the 1800s. He loved to ski and scale peaks in the Alps, but he had spent more time sailing yachts than climbing. He let his older brother manage the family business while he spent the proceeds on his adventures. At 42, Wolf felt it was time to make his mark on the world, so he accepted Weissner's invitation to climb K2. In a letter, Wolf assured his brother that he wouldn't take any unnecessary risk. Still out of good sense, he rewrote his will before he left. In Europe, the team spent 10 days buying gear, gloves, boots, pythons, goggles, tents, and stoves before long Weissner ran out of money. At equipment shops and expensive restaurants, he handed the bills to Wolf. In mid-April, thanks in part to Wolf's money, the climbers arrived in Srinagar with four tons of supplies. They were still a month-long trek from the mountain, and Wolf already felt uneasy about the team. Cranmore was so quiet it was nearly impossible to get to know him. Durant's and Sheldon seemed to treat the trip like a fraternity party. They got drunk on champagne and flirted with women. They started water fights and made fart jokes. Wolf began to wonder if they were truly prepared for K2. He had been urging Weissner to buy two-way radios so they could communicate between camps on the mountain. Before they left Srinagar, he found out that Weissner had ignored him. Weissner hated technology, and in 1939, radio sets were bulky and heavy to carry. As a result, Weissner had spent the money on other supplies. They would communicate by smoke signals, he said. It was a ridiculous idea, Wolf thought. Even if they had material to burn, the first puff of smoke would be blown into China on 50 mile per hour winds before it communicated anything to anyone. On May 2nd, despite his doubts, Wolf joined a long line of porters and ponies loaded down with gear. The procession snaked out of Srinagar, Srinagar following the same route Houston and his team had taken a year earlier. They made their way through desert plains, green apricot orchards, and narrow canyons flanked by high crumbling cliffs. Pasang Kakuli and a team of eight Sherpas had joined the men at Srinagar. A few of the men, Finsu, Pemba, Katar, and Sonam, had been with Kakuli the year before on Houston expedition. On the trail, they set up tents for the Sahibs, made them tea, and carried their personal gear. 
Kukuli was their Sirdar, our leader. At this point, he was probably the most experienced Himalayan mountaineer alive. It would be his ninth expedition to the high peaks in 11 years. His feet were battered by frostbite from the disaster on Nanga Parbat, but he had come through Houston's expedition unhurt. Weissner felt lucky to have him. Whatever hazards lay ahead, they didn't seem to worry Durant and Sheldon. The two classmates bounded along the trail as though hiking were a competitive sport. They raced each other, other to the next ridge and played tag along the way. But as the route climbed toward the glacier that formed the final pathway to K2, they began to feel the elevation. Both Durant's and Sheldon were plagued by headaches and sleepless nights. Wolf took it all in without saying much. He wondered why Weisner didn't step in and warn the boys to stop wasting their energy. As the days wore on, he tried to avoid the others. At night, he aired out his blisters and massaged his throbbing ankles and shins. In the morning, he left early or lag behind. As civilization receded, Wolf wanted to get away from Weissner's moods and the shrill laughter of the boys. They ruined the silent majesty of the land that welcomed them day after day into its sanctuary. By the middle of May, they had put 200 miles between themselves and the nearest automobile. The last telegraph machine lay behind them in the town of Scardu. They were cut off from the outside world jagged peaks towering overhead as they had for millions of years. Dudley Wolf had never seen anything like it. On May 30th, the climbers rounded a bend in the glacier and got their first glimpse of K2. They started up the Godwin-Austin Glacier just 10 miles from the base of the mountain. But as they counted off the final miles, the procession stalled. The porters, one after another, dropped to their knees in the snow. They clutched at their eyes and groaned in pain. They had been marching for days on the blinding white glacier without snow goggles to protect them. Protect them. The sun's rays had seared the corneas of their eyes. They were going snow blind. It was a familiar story on Himalayan expeditions. The European or American climbers spent most of their money on their own gear. The porters were left to supply themselves. In the low valleys, temperatures could run over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Most villagers wore sandals and thin wood shawls, wool shawls. They didn't have money to invest in heavy boots, jackets, or goggles. Expedition leaders simply picked the porters who looked best equipped and hoped they would last the entire journey. So as the 1939 expedition climbed into mountain weather, many of their porters trudged through the snow in torn sandals, even bare feet. At night, Weissner, Wolf, and the other Western climbers disappeared into tents and zipped themselves into down sleeping bags. The porters huddled together under tarps in the frigid wind. During the day, they faced the blinding glare of the sun without protection. On the glacier, George Trent, the British transport officer who was in charge of the porters, tried to talk the group into moving but the men refused. Snow blindness is, blindness is intensely painful and the only cure to sit with the cold cloth on the eyes and wait for the swelling to go away. Finally, Durant and Kramer dug out some cardboard, cut it into strips and carved slits for eye holes to filter the light. With their makeshift sunglasses, most of the porters agreed to move on, but three of them still sat with their heads in their hands. From behind his store-bought snow goggles, Sheldon yelled at them, get up and get moving, but the men couldn't do it. Finally, they were paid off and sent home with help from two porters who could still see. With the five loads redistributed, the expedition turned toward the mountain for the final day's trek. That is a compelling and sad, so many ways, sad story. Uh, we're going to stop on page 61 tomorrow when we begin. Um, we'll start there. There's two pictures on these two pages. We'll start on page 62 and uh, 63. And uh, thank you for listening. And I hope some of you are reading ahead. Uh, this is a really compelling uh, true story. Thanks so much, ninth graders. See you tomorrow.